Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our event today, Getting Online Education Right. We have a great panel today, so we'll get started right away so we have more time to hear from them. I'm Jenna Robinson, president of the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. The Martin Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to higher education reform. We advocate responsible governance, viewpoint diversity, academic quality, cost-effective education solutions, and innovative market-based reform. Today's panelists, uh, we have a distinguished group, so I'm not going to read their full bios, which are available on our website, but I'll tell you a little bit about them. We have Marty Kotis, a member of the UNC System Board of Governors and chair of the Board of Governors Working Group on Online Education. Scott Rawls, who is president of Wake Tech Community College. Doug Shackelford, who is dean of the UNC Keenan Flagler Business School. Catherine Truitt, Truitt who is chancellor of Western Governors University, North Carolina and Nicole Divers, a UNC Chapel Hill senior majoring in political science and economics. And as I said, their full bios are available on our website. And I look forward to hearing from all of them today. Today's event will be a panel discussion, and I'm sure it will be both lively and informative. Panelists, I don't hesitate to jump in if you have something to say. Viewers, you can post a question uh, by clicking the Q&A icon at, at any time. It's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and when we get to the end of the panel, I'll pose your questions uh, to the panelists. And to viewers who are watching on Facebook, simply put your questions in the comments section and we'll be sure to monitor those as well. We're recording this event so you can watch it later or you'll be able to share it online. So to start off, I'll ask each panelist to just briefly explain his or her experiences with online education and I'll, I'll call on you one at a time for at least this first one, and then we can have a little bit more free-flowing discussion. So we'll start with Catherine. Tell me about uh, your experiences with online education. Thanks so much, Jenna, and thanks to the, to the Martin Center. This is really excited to be here, and I'm in such great company. So what, what a great way to um, spend a Thursday. <clears throat> so WGU North Carolina is a nonprofit, 100% online, university whose mission is to expand access to higher education for those who might not have it otherwise. So we <clears throat> have been around um, nationally since 1997 when a bipartisan group of governors from the western side of the country had unmet workforce demand and decided they wanted to leverage the dawn of the internet to create an online university. Fast forward to now, we launched a state affiliate in North Carolina um, exactly three years ago. And we have uh, grown to about 3,900 students um, who all live in North Carolina. And um, our students have had a 100% uninterrupted education experience since COVID hit, which should not be a surprise since we were already online. So Scott, we'll turn to you next. Tell me about your experiences. Well, thank you, Jen. I'm glad to be with everybody today. Uh, my earliest experiences probably began almost 20 years ago when I became uh, president of Craven Community College. Uh, community colleges in North Carolina at that time were kind of pioneering, coming together, working together in terms of uh, sharing resources, what was turned into be turned out to be called the Learning Object Repository, a way in which we share uh, in our efforts in that regard to, to share resources and develop resources. So. That was my earliest experience. I've been the system president in North Carolina, so the work has taken place collectively. I was president of Northern Virginia Community College, which was a leader in community college online education. And then now back at Wake Tech in the last year and a half, and Wake Tech's a very, uh, has been ranked in a couple of uh, national rankings, the number one online community college in the country. Um, my personal experience, I never have taught an online course. I've taught uh, you know, I've taught university and community college courses before, but never in an online environment. But I'm married to an adjunct online community college educator at a neighboring college. So I experience it every day watching over her shoulder, both the, the rewards and sometimes frustrations in that regard. So that's a, my, as much as anything, a personal experience I have uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, tell us about what you've done at UNC. Well, it's a privilege to be with this group, and uh, I thank you for inviting me. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, I was part of a small group, and we tried to see if we thought there was technology that existed, which will enable us to basically replicate what we were doing in our MBA program at Chapel Hill. 
Um, we concluded then that the technology didn't exist for us to provide the same quality education um, in an electronic form. Um, but about five years later, about a decade ago, um, I was the, uh, the leader of uh, starting uh, what we call MBA UNC. Um, and uh, the goal then was uh, what we called no compromise. We, didn't, we wanted to be able to go into a, have an online MBA program that would be uh, equivalent in uh, quality in all regards uh, to what we were doing in the residential program in Chapel Hill. Same uh, admission standards, same curriculum, um, same instructors, et cetera. Uh, we've been really pleased with that uh, program. Four years later, we started a master's of accounting program with the very same uh, criteria. And today we have about 1,200 students in those two programs combined. Excellent. Marty? Oh, mute, uh, Marty, you're muted. There we go. Okay, I'm wonderful. Early adopter, but apparently don't know how to turn off the, uh, the mute button. <laughs> but uh, um, I've been a tech early adopter. I've always enjoyed uh, the benefits of technology. I joined the UNC System Board of Governors in 2013 and have been a strong advocate of a robust online ad platform because I feel like that allows us to reach out to people who cannot uh, consume the traditional model of education and benefit those North Carolinians who most need it uh, that are struggling with challenges of work and family as well. Uh, this COVID experience has been a real eye opener and it has shaped some of my thoughts on online since then, but um, excited to, to participate in the panel today. Thank you. So Nicole, I want you to tell me about your experience with online education and also elaborate just a little bit on, you know, what are students actually getting? Because we know that this is an unusual experience. Um, faculty members were thrown into doing this without adequate preparation. Obviously, no one plans for a pandemic. Um, and so I don't want to fault faculty members, but I do want to hear about what are students actually experiencing right now in terms of online ed? And Nicole, you are muted. Oh, it's not letting you unmute. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you for having me. I want to apologize in advance if my if I freeze or drop out. My internet um, at home is hanging by a thread. Um, but yeah, my experiences with online education are both from um, a student perspective and an instructor perspective to some extent. Um, getting to serve as a ULA. Um, I've taken online courses. Paul, that tell us what a ULA is, because I think that's a that the term m many of our viewers won't know. Yeah, it's an undergraduate learning assistant, so it's a similar role as a TA, um, except we are obviously undergrads, so we mostly come to class and hold workshop hours outside of class to help with in-class and um, homework assignments for students. Um, and it's definitely been a transition. I know at UNC, I've taken online classes before in the past that were set up and designed specifically to be online courses. Now, moving courses that are not intended to be online to an online setting. Um, it's been a different experience. I know specifically for the class that I ULA for, it's very heavy um, coding in R, um, which can sometimes be a challenge to help students with through a screen um, if they're not fully grasping the material. Um, it can be difficult not working with them face to face and kind of fielding some questions online. But I think overall, um, we've adapted as best we can for this class specifically. And what are your, most of your faculty, most of the professors, what technology are they using to deliver the online education? In your experience, Nicole. Oh. I think I'll just leave it off mute for the rest of the time. Yeah. Um, so for the class that you will lay for, um, it was already a flipped classroom setting. So we did use DataCamp as an online resource for students to kind of get introduced to a lot of new subjects in R. Um, I know for some of my other classes, we're using a lot of online forums. So both through Sakai as well as Piazza, um, posting on forums there. 
excellent. So now I want to pose questions to some of the people who have done it before. And I'll start with Doug. What does a robust online course that it has been designed to be online from the very beginning, what does that look like? Well, I can tell you what we, we have done. Um, we basically stripped out everything that I call one-way communication. Uh, so you might think of a lecture. Uh, I always say, you know, if I was teaching U.S. history, I say George Washington was the first president. Um, uh, that's, that's not something to discuss. That's not, I'm not looking for a debate on that. That's just the fact. Uh, we can put that in a computer form. You can watch that on your leisure time. If you have trouble with that, you can go back and watch it again. If the exam comes up, you can watch that another time. So we put that in a synchronous form. Um, in fact, with our classes, you can take that with you the rest of your life. You have access to that. Um, and then we, uh, we have live classes. Uh, in our case, we limit those classes to around um, the upper teens, uh, between 15, 18 students plus an instructor. We call it the Brady Bunch uh, for those who are old enough to appreciate that. And so it looks a little bit like what we have here, just a few more people. And that is all two-way communication. So there shouldn't be anything in there. I shouldn't be in there saying George Washington's first president. What I might be doing is saying, let's contrast George Washington to some other president, and we might have a discussion there. Our students might do a presentation. We might do cold calling, all the other elements that involve human interaction. Um, and so that's the, uh, the dichotomy that we make in the classroom. Um, and then we also, in our case, uh, every quarter we have the students gather somewhere. They're not required to gather every time, every quarter, but they are required to get together some quarters because there are some things we have not found a way to do electronically. There are just some things in a, uh, a business school environment. We do case competitions, for example. We, we need to put them under some time pressure to make some decisions. And so it's, it's hard to do that, or we... Let me just say, we haven't figured out a way to do that as well. Um, but I, I think there's many things that over the years we found we can do. I think Nicole hit on a really good one a moment ago about R. You need to find a way to enable people to practice and have someone watch you and then correct you and then try again and that, that sort of thing. Um, so that's the way we sort of have to design things. Uh, strip out all the one-way communication, put it in a place where it can be archived, and then the classroom becomes an extremely intense period. Um, we also archive the live classes. So uh, if you ask our students, uh, how do you study for the exam? Many of them will say, I just watched the entire class over again. Uh, the other thing that's helpful there with office hours is students sometimes will come in and say, I didn't understand when you said this or that. Well, sometimes I don't even have any idea what they're referring to because I can't even remember when I said this or that. And, um, so what we can do is just push the dial and we can run it up and say, oh, okay, so when, when I said, you know, A is greater than B, uh, I understand how you got confused because two minutes earlier I said B was greater than A. So let's unwind what all that means. But again, it's all archived. So that's, that's the way we design our classes. Okay. Scott, tell me a little bit about how most classes or some classes are designed at Wake Tech. Well, I think it's very similar. Um, it, the best of online instruction has a high amount of instructor engagement, instructor presence, uh, and deliberate in that regard in terms of what those best practices are. So it is not automated in, uh, instruction by any means. And so it's also strategies in terms of not just, you know, a link, but also how you chunk different materials uh, constantly with promoting instructor presence, uh, one of which making sure that every one of our classes has the capability for for synchronous education tied in with other types of supplements. Um, and for us, what's been very important is the whole training and uh, preparation for instructors. So all of our uh, instructors go through what we refer to as an EPIC 30 certification. Uh, we have our standards, our norms, uh, our capabilities, our tools, and our resources. And we want everybody to know those uh, before they go into a uh, to teach online education. And now they're all teaching online education. So all of our instructors have been through our EPIC 30 certification, or if they're new this semester and haven't had a chance, they have a, a, a mentor working with them. So we think that's a very important part of it. Excellent, thank you. And 
Catherine, obviously WGU is all online, so you've been doing it, but I want you to talk about just one little part, and that is I know you have majors in health and nursing, and that to me seems especially challenging to do online. So if you could talk about you know, how you approach STEM and science through, <laughs> through an online course. Well, I, I, I will combine that answer with the, the, an answer to the other question about how we develop a course. So our value proposition is that we are asynchronous. So 76% of our students work full time. We have a disaggregated faculty model. That means that our, we have um, course instructor, uh, you know, student facing faculty as well as a course development team. So we have assessment and curriculum faculty as well. So this, this the, our academic team, which includes subject matter experts that are both internal and external um, and frequently are industry councils as well, um, work to develop a set of competencies. We are 100% competency based as well, which means that students are progressing through their courses, um, not, not by the credit hour, but by mastery of uh, demonstration of mastering the, the competencies. <clears throat> and so, these groups, along with compliance and accreditation, um, work together to develop the course. Um, it, it goes through a, a quality assurance and testing a, a three to six, which is like a three to six week cycle where we actually test the program to make sure that there are, are no kinks. Um, and then we do, uh, it launches and then we do continuous monitoring and training. There's a triage center. There's actually a button that students click on to start a ticket if there is any sort of a, a, an issue. Um, but our, our, um, we have our own learning management system where the content is delivered. And as far as the um, science pieces go, our students, our pre-service pre teachers, as well as our nursing students do participate in clinicals the same way that any other um, student would. And we partner with hospitals and with schools. And I'm excited to say that we were able to fulfill the student teaching obligations and clinicals for all of our um, student teachers and our uh, nursing students during, during COVID. We actually, um, our students do labs as well. We send home, a, we send home a fetal pig in a box. It's a lab in a box and they perform the lab on camera. Um, and we have, um, every student has a mentor who is a master's degree level in the field in which the student is studying that stays with them throughout the, the, the whole time of their program. But then our course instructors who are always available one-on-one -on -one with students stay, are, are the PhDs in the, in the field who stay with them throughout the, the um, the course as opposed to the whole degree. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. You know, I asked about science because I've heard horror stories from some students recently about they have to watch their TA perform the lab you know, via Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what's been going on a lot right now. And I'm not gonna throw any school or any faculty member under the bus because obviously this is a, a highly unusual situation. But it's great to hear how you've innovated to make sure that students are able to do their labs and you know, do those things that seem so challenging. So next I want to talk about, you know, you talked a little bit about, we, I heard the word synchronous and asynchronous, you know, mastery based. Um, but let's talk about what are some of the advantages of online education um, that, you know, that really attract us to it in non-COVID times, you know, what, what does it offer? You know, why do we want to pursue this? And Marty, I'll start with you because I know you've been pushing this for UNC. So tell me what, you know, why is this a good option for our students? I've, I've got you, Marty. I, I think I just, I just <laughs> unmuted. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it wouldn't let me unmute there. Yeah, Ashley, so, if you can, I'm going to pause. Ashley, I know you. maybe there's something you can do about the muting situation. I don't know if you can change <laughs> a, um, the way something's set up. Thank you. Go ahead, Marty. So I've been a fan of online because I think it really reaches out to um, 
all of the various people out there with challenges. So they may have a work challenge, they may have a family challenge, they may not be able to dedicate uh, four years of living on campus somewhere. And I think reaching out to them in the way that works for them is important to do. And online allows us to do that for people with tough schedules. It allows us to do that for people in remote areas that can't uh, come in or can't afford to be on campus or devote that sort of time. So I think that's the main benefit of it. But I think the future of online is going to be that it includes more uh, gamification and VR elements that take it to the next level, which really make it nearly as robust or even more robust than uh, in-person instruction. But that's a big lift. And I think with COVID, we've seen a little bit of a move towards that, but we, we've still got a ways to go. But I'm, I highly anticipate that in the next 10 years, we're gonna have some systems out there that are phenomenal, that are better than our traditional uh, teaching methods because they include more bells and whistles and the ability to interact with people and service a lot more people uh, than we normally would. Thank you. Um, Nicole, and I'm unmuting you now. Um, have you seen any, um, any advantages in your experiences that, you know, the classes you've taken last semester and this semester, are there any kind of unexpected bonuses of online? Yeah, definitely. I think um, the flexibility that it allows, I know from just a personal anecdote, I adopted a dog this semester. Um, so being fully online allows me to stay home with her 24-7. Um, but I think people with hectic schedules, it allows kind of better flexibility um, so they can be better prepared for classes and exams as well. Um, and with programs like Zoom, you're not you're only missing out on so much from that in-person experience. So there's definitely been um, those advantages, I think, to online education this semester. It's, that's good, to, good to hear. Um, Doug, tell me about some of the advantages you've seen, because obviously you're, you're doing a graduate program. It's, you know, it's different. Um, what have you seen? Looks like we might have temporarily lost uh, Doug. I'll wait for him. I'll turn to turn to Scott. Scott, what are some of the advantages you see with the community college students? Well, I think when you look at college students in general, the majority of college students today are non-traditional students. And for a community college, just like with WGU, that means students who work. And so I think that's why community colleges uh, have been as, as a sector out in front in online education because we needed to be able to provide the convenience for the majority for those students who are working college students um, and so i think that that's been a you know a major reason why community colleges were in this game 20 20 years ago 25 years ago at wake tech i think the next though iteration is really what marty was talking about is more 2.0 is the you know, it's the idea of the flipped classroom, it's the efficiencies of online education, but also the advantages of having multiple forms of supplemental instruction. Uh, you know, Wake Tech, we had the first MOOC of a community college, a way to bring supplemental resources to uh, students in terms of college readiness. And so using different forms to supplement what has been the tradition of uh, lecture-based uh, delivery, I think offers a, a whole new advantage uh, for many students, not just convenience, but also um, a more comprehensive learning environment. Yeah, and Catherine, I think you're the you're the only one here who's the, has experience with mastery based education, and that's something that I think lends itself, especially towards online being online. Uh, tell us a little bit more about mastery based education, and you know why is that WGU's model, and why is it good for students? It's, it's been our model for, gosh, um, over a decade. I think that it's good for students because it is, it provides the foundation for um, the efficiencies that we're trying to provide. So the, the credit hour in so many ways um, it is making less and less sense in the higher education space 
as we live in a knowledge economy and are moving towards a more uh, skills-based um, way of doing business uh, and, and producing graduates. And, and so I think when we prioritize competencies, uh, which is another way of saying what, what learners know and can do, that this dovetails with what we're seeing employers need, which is, uh, you know, shovel-ready grads who, who are ready on day one to um, be a value add. And the idea that, um, for I'll, I'll give you a perfect example, um, a, a lot of folks who are entry level in IT, um, they might have a community college degree, they might not, they might just have some certificates, which and the certificates are the gold standard in IT, but <clears throat> in order to move up, they need to have a degree. And so um, if they come to us, they're going to move very quickly through their IT degree because they already have knowledge that they don't need to um, spend um, extra time and money pursuing um, credit hours when they already have demonstrated mastery of those competencies in IT. And, and so I think that this is not just true in IT, but it's true for our teacher assistants who come, come to us with you know, 15 years of experience in the classroom. It's true for, uh, we're, we're the number one military friendly university um, in the country. Uh, it's certainly true for, for those folks. And it's true for, um, as, as Scott mentioned a minute ago, um, those adults who are um, looking to return to school, who are working full time, um, they've, they've certainly had you know, maybe 15 years working in an office um, or in, uh, we have a, 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 I gave a scholarship to a student a couple weeks ago who's been working as an accountant for 20 years without any formal training and now has got to have that piece of paper that says they can do this. So I think that competency-based education is a recognition of um, the, the, the changes in workforce development that we continue to experience. Thank you. And now I wanna talk about kind of the people's attitudes towards online education. I think before COVID and now even more so that people have had bad experiences, you know, they call it Zoom U in some cases, um, there's a little bit of a stigma attached to online education. And, you know, I want to talk about, you know, why, why is that? And Doug, I'll turn to you first, because I think you, in your no compromises attitude towards creating the online MBA, I think there's, there's kind of an implicit recognition that you have to do something special to make sure that people know that there's value in this. So talk about that stigma. Um, well, I feel like these are the good old days uh, because I'll tell you, a decade ago, trying to sell an online MBA program at Chapel Hill is one of the most difficult things I've ever done. Um, I, got, I got rotten apples thrown at me from everybody. Our alumni revolted, our students revolted, everybody else revolted. Um, basically, it was, uh, you know, we had decided, obviously, to throw our brand to the uh, wolves. Um, a lot has changed in the last decade. And, um, you know, I think, um, I actually think what we're experiencing now is probably going to accelerate uh, a movement in this direction by at least 10 years. It, it is true that uh, what a lot of people are experiencing right now is just triage. Um, in March, we had basically one week to convert our entire undergraduate programs at Chapel Hill over to um, a, a form. And I, and I think it's been an extraordinary uh, done extraordinarily well because students and faculty have just said, this, we'll do the best we can with what we have. But K through 12 is doing the very same thing. And uh, before long, the notion of doing education in a non-traditional form is no longer going to be novel or weird or anything else. The analogy I've always used is there was a time not too long ago that the thought of um, going online to find a person to have a relationship with sounded really weird. Um, now the thought of finding a relationship by going out and meeting a stranger at a bar seems really weird. 
And I think education is in many ways heading in a similar path where uh, someday the notion of I'll travel halfway across the country and uproot my entire family um, to get an education when I could stay at home and maintain some of the relationships. And, and in our case, all of our uh, online students are working professionals. Um, that's going to seem weird when you've got those opportunities. And, and picking up on something that um, Nicole said, and I think Marty was alluding to this, this is much more built around a student-centric model. Um, we, use, we started with the word flexibility. That was the other word we used along without, with no compromise. So if you, you think from what's best for the student as opposed to what's best for other constituencies, and those constituencies might be the faculty or the university or the administration or someone else, then you start thinking about, well, what would be best for the students? And for some students, um, it's wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to spend four years or perhaps a graduate student to spend some time at a university. We, we offer all those residential programs and they're wonderful. But for other people, those opportunities, they aren't there. And I think that what we're going through right now, and Lord knows I hate COVID and wish, you know, just like all the rest of us, we wish we could snap our fingers and it go away. But but we've all been exposed to it. And we've been exposed to a different form of learning and it will not be that strange to say, oh, you know, I think the next time I go, I'll, I'll think about this other alternative. Uh, but I can tell you, and I'm, I'm sure some of the others on the screen can tell you, there was a time a few years ago where it was near impossible for me to even have discussions with my friends, not to speak of others, about the, the uh, possibility of quality education occurring, you know, in this form. Mm -hmm. Marty, I think that you've, you've experienced some frustrations trying to move faster with online uh, at the system level. Is it because of the stigma? What, what's some of the pushback you get? Yeah, I, I've been very frustrated with that because I see this as a major disruptor. You know, you figure in the mid 90s when I was developing websites for my company, people were still getting faxes and they, they weren't Googling anything. You think about social media really only being since 2010 for majorly catching on. Uh, the speed at which technology is becoming so prevalent and affecting our lives is significant. When you want to know something, what do you say? Google it. When you want to find out how to do something, you look for a YouTube video and watch it. You know, I watched a video the other day on how to repair an um, espresso machine and fixed my espresso machine by ordering different parts. I had them from Amazon and I got it fixed within two days faster than sending it back to the manufacturer. So it's coming and in a big way. And I, I've been frustrated because I don't feel like we're, we're treating this seriously enough or responding as quickly enough because at some point it could result in some very empty buildings if we don't adjust and adapt very quickly to this. We don't have 20 years to slowly move towards this. We have to jump into this right now. The resistance I think has come from in any sort of an organization, if you take a major disruptor and you're proposing change, people are resistant to change. They also don't think it will happen very quickly. COVID changed that. We had to respond immediately to it. And if we had COVID going on every year after this for five years, other than all the other problems we'd be facing, we still would have to adapt very quickly. So I think COVID proved the need for this. And again, we're facing a major disruptor. We have to move faster. Mm -hmm. Catherine, tell me about the reception that WGU has received, and do you think that there has been a good reception to an all online education? Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate Marty's frustrations um, for, for many reasons. Uh, and um, would love to just share that when we, when we look at WGU nationally, uh, and or maybe even from a regional perspective, what we find is that, that there are um, certain regions are more tied to their academic institutions than other regions. So the Northeast does not have the, or sorry, the, nor uh, the Northwest does not have the same sort of um, um, 
uh, I, loyalty, I guess, is a good word. Uh, there's just not the same kind of systems there in higher education that we have in the Southeast. And North Carolina is a really good example of that. And so um, when, um, when we first came to North Carolina, there was great resistance. We were perceived as a, a threat. Um, a lot of people thought we were a for-profit institution. There was, you know, just, um, you know, a lot of misinformation. Um, community colleges felt threatened by us, I think. Um, and I think now that people see that there's, I mean, gosh, we only have half of our population between 25 and 44 in the state have a post-secondary credential of marketplace value. There's plenty of, um, plenty of need in this state for us all to coexist peacefully. But I do think that it's, that there are some institutional factors at play here that really prevent um, WGU North Carolina from engaging at the state level the way uh, we, might, we might like to. Our community college partners have really embraced us. Uh, we, we have a partnership, for example, with, with Wake Tech. Um, our ability to articulate what their students are coming to us with have the potential to solve um, our crisis in our state of not enough IT professionals, not enough nurses in rural counties, as well as not enough teachers. Um, and, and so um, I, I do think it's interesting those, those sort of regional differences. And I would encourage North Carolina to um, accept this disruption and um, think, think about what it's going to look like to move forward because certainly we're seeing this happen more quickly in other parts of the country. Jenna, can I offer a follow-up to that? Yeah, absolutely. I was serving on the Ed Planning Committee when Western Governors came before us, and you know, I've been on there since 2013, and y'all came in in 2015-ish, maybe? Or? The process started about that time, yes. Yeah, and there was a discussion at that time where people did see Western Governors as a threat and as a competitor, and I spoke up against that, and some others did, that said, no, we don't need to see uh, these private institutions or outside institutions as a threat. It's about educating the people of the state. It's not about our system doing it. If someone else can do it better, faster, cheaper, why not allow consumers in the uh, state those uh, options and that selection? So uh, I'm glad to have Western governors here and I, I, I welcome as many others that can solve the, uh, the needs of North Carolina citizens. It shouldn't be about protecting our system or protecting certain things. It should be about the people of the state, not mm -hmm. the systems of the state. Yeah, exactly. Scott, I'll give you a chance at this question as well, but I imagine that community college students you know, embrace online rather than you know, viewing it like with any kind of stigma. Am I wrong about that? No, I think that's right. I think it's sort of, it's just part of being a community college student. And I think, you know, with the Western governor's uh, conversation, I remember I was system president when Western governors came in. And one of the things that I felt excited about was the transfer opportunities for many of our students in those areas like healthcare, IT, they need those transfer opportunities. And that was something that Western governors provided for our students uh, even more than we had in North Carolina. I think for online education, you know, we have to get, we have to get out of our categories in some ways, uh, both sectors, but also in terms of, you know, what's an online student? So for us, while at Wake Tech, a minority of our students in a normal semester, this is not a normal semester, but in a normal non-COVID semester, a minority of our students here are going to be fully online students, but the vast majority of our students do take one or more online courses. And I think the evolution of where we move to is really where all of our students have some aspect of services or instruction that's in an online format. So for us, you know, what you can do online in welding versus what you can do online in psychology is a very different thing. But even in welding, there are online supplements and supports and resources. Uh, I'm here at our North Campus today, just watching what our baking and pastry program has been able to do in an online format has been phenomenal. So I don't think, you know, I think we're moving to a time when it's not about, are you an online student or not? or whether you take online courses or not, but I think most courses we provide are gonna have some elements of online. It's just dependent on what 
best for that particular program. Uh, Jenna, can Go I ahead. add? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want to say that that what Scott said is identical to where I see Chapel Hill headed. Um, and I, I talk about this all the time. Uh, in fact, I try not to talk about in-person or online programs or students. I believe we are, we are moving toward a point in which it's, it's what's best for that particular class and what's best for that particular student, and they're all blurring and, and blending and merging together. And I think if we keep our eye on what's best for the student, as opposed to all the other constituents, we will get the right answer. Um, but we are moving definitely in the direction Scott just said. And I, I might add to one of the things we've had to learn through COVID, a place we've had to really try to catch up is, you know, student success is not just about what happens in the instructional classroom or online environment. It's the things around them. And so in many ways, we had moved fast as a community college in those areas in terms of online instruction, but we were slower in terms of the other types of support services. So what's been really uh, in the COVID time frame, uh, I think very fulfilling here at Wake Tech is how we've moved quickly in areas like our tutoring centers to watch how our tutoring centers provide online access. And so as, um, as we move back to a, a norm, our norm won't be a pre-COVID norm. It'll be a new norm that'll be better than we were because of what we're providing through the, the capability of being both all having being you know, having our own site services more, but also even more expansion in terms of the accessibility of multiple forms of online resources, whether those be instructional or support services. Nicole, what's your impression? I know that you don't, you don't speak for all students, but you've probably been talking to your friends and your classmates. Um, are, the, are you and they, you know, excited about the opportunities of online or are you just wanting to get back to, you know, quote unquote normal? I think most students are pretty ambivalent towards online classes. I think more than anything, um, what they feel they're missing out on is sort of like campus life and not necessarily like in-person classes. Um, the biggest stigma towards online classes is more um, that people are still paying full tuition for them. It's not so much actually having your class online, it's that you're paying the same amount that you are for your regular in-person classes. Um, especially for departments that are more hands-on. I know I'm political science and economics, and those aren't um, particularly hands-on courses. Um, but some of my friends who are bio majors or who have a lot of labs, they especially feel like um, they might not be getting their money's worth out of it. Um, and when you're paying for, sorry, my dogs are going insane. Um, when you're paying for, um, tuition, you're also paying for all of the other things that we don't get to use. You're paying for the gyms on campus, you're paying um, to get to go to games and dining halls. And so I think students, it's less about the actual class and more about all this other stuff that we're missing out on. I think most students, um, in terms of actual class, they, they like being in class, but they also like being able to get up and attend class in their pajamas. So <laughs> there's mixed emotions. I, I can definitely understand that. And I think, you know, one of the things that we're all ex experiencing and using right now is, is Zoom. So I want to talk a little bit about Zoom. Honestly, it's been a game changer for us and it came around just at the right time. We tried to do an event like this one um, probably a year and a half ago and it was really hard to do q and It was hard to separate panelists from attendees we looked around a long time trying to find the right webinar tools and you know we just didn't find anything that we liked that much and you know now we've got zoom and it it does everything we need in terms of delivering a webinar at a great price um, and i know that a lot of universities are using it to deliver lectures and to deliver class discussions so you know as a tool what what do you all think of Zoom? You know, what does it deliver that is good for higher ed or for online education? And you know, what else do we need? What do we look for? What can't Zoom do? Um, and I'll open that to you know anyone who's used it a lot for either for teaching or has seen people teach with it. What I don't know who wants to jump in on that. 
I, I'll I'll jump in. Okay. So so it, it's a huge it's a huge improvement over what we were using earlier, which was uh, a variation of of Adobe. Um, but I, I'll tell you, there's a future coming, and I've talked to a couple of companies that are working on this. That's going to be much better than Zoom in the academic setting. Now, what Zoom may be the best thing for what we're doing right now, or for some commercial uses. But um, imagine a situation in which, if, you, if the six of us were in a class, um, and the screen could tell the instructor things like how we did on the homework last night, could tell how many times we've answered a question, could tell all sorts of information about us. And that's some of the things. How many times have we spoke up in class this semester? So there is a tremendous amount of knowledge that the system has or could have that right now Zoom doesn't provide me as an instructor. And so uh, uh, there's some companies right now that are working on that. I think um, uh, we're, we have been talking with one. We're not ready to adopt it, but we're basically telling them, Here, if you could provide us all this, these sorts of things, we're ready to jump. Because I think the technology that would Technology like that would make the instructor in such a better position uh, than what we have right now. So uh, uh, you can just see where, and I like to, instead of online, I like the word technology enhanced learning. Technology could make it a much better setting than we have. Uh, many of us do things like class participation and put that into the grade. That is one of the most difficult things to do. You know, after we get off this, this uh, webinar, if you ask me how much Marty said, I, I won't even remember, you know. But yet I go in and I teach classes all the time, and I'm supposed to critique Marty's comments with Nicole's comments with, with Catherine's comments. Technology is going to give us all those kind of things very soon. And they'll be able to tell us that, you know, Scott, Scott uh, has participated more than anyone else. So that's, that's the future. And I'm sorry my screen keeps going out, but I am on the phone. Okay, wonderful. I'm glad we can at least hear you. Um, so I'll, I'll share a complaint that I've heard from from one of uh, you know, one of the students that I know, and that is that it's really hard to focus and pay attention on Zoom compared to being in person. Um, and I wonder if that's something that anyone would like to address. I jump in on that. I, sure. I think it is. I think people are distracted. It's easy enough when you're on Zoom to pull up your phone or look at messages and watch something else. Um, and I think, uh, you know, getting more participation uh, in the classroom. We use, we've started using Mentimeter in our physical presentations to gather feedback from uh, all the attendees and have them answer on their phone so we can ask a question and 100 people are going to reply at once, and then we can see the results on the screen or suggest ideas, and the ideas will pop up on the screen. Um, I'd like to see more of that in Zoom, and I'm sure we're going to be headed that way. Um, I also like the idea of VR for Zoom, where you can be more interactive and looking around, and it, and it will take out all of the other distractions for you. You've got the headset on. Maybe you're watching the professor over here, but you can look over there and see something or uh, virtually look up, but it's all locked into what you're talking about. Um, so I, I'm excited for what we'll see with products like Zoom over the next few years, especially as VR starts to get more integrated. I'm excited how this may translate back into more augmented reality options for the classroom. Um, per Doug's comment, if you can have your glasses on, and it's tracking different people when they're in the classroom speaking, or you could see some information about that student, that would be a, a game changer. Mm -hmm. Catherine, I think you said you used a different technology. Can you tell me what it offers? So because we are 100% um, asynchronous, that everything is independent of time and place, we are not using um, Zoom or WebEx for instruction. Um, but I, but as a, as a, you know, I, I'm, as a staff member, as a leader in my state, I am um, partnering with another nonprofit arm of our university that's based in Seattle to offer a um, 
pilot program to seniors in high school in Vance County. So this sort of cross country collaboration to benefit um, people in my community, in my state, um, is something that Zoom has allowed us to do. And I, th I think that, <clears throat> um, you know, our, we're fully funded on tuition receipts. We look at every dollar that we spend as, is this a good use of student money? And being able to have even more economies of scale because of um, the technology that's available to us now um, through these platforms is just absolutely incredible. So you actually, you brought me to our next question, which is how do we make online education affordable and scalable? Because one of the things I often hear is that the startup costs or the beginning costs for online ed are tremendous. And therefore we shouldn't view online ed as a money saver. Um, but Scott, I'm going to turn this one over to you first. I know community colleges are always watching the bottom line and watching their budgets. So, you know, how do we scale online? Well, I think, one, I think one of the things to keep in mind in that regard is that um, education, in terms of online education, um, you know, the vast majority of our expenses are, are technology and people. And the, you know, where folks think there's going to be huge savings in online education is typically when they think about it being automated education. If it was automated and we could just turn it on, without instructors, then we wouldn't have the, the people cost. But the best practices, the best of online education is highly instructor engaged. So it is, it is not less instructor demanding, it is even more instructor demanding. And that's what gets lost sometimes in the notion of cost because if the majority of our costs are people and technology, there's not, yes, there are savings in terms of facilities, but that's not our greatest cost area. Um, I think that what it does provide for us though is it provides a sense of scalability that we start to mm -hmm. see where we can share we can interact i mean I, I, in essence that's what you know happens when you talk about wgu you scale up the opportunity for transfer you scale up to where i don't have to physically go to a place to do something and so i get past those barriers that allow me uh, to participate i think that um and we've seen places that have scaled and been able to take very difficult areas like a, a Georgia Tech, for instance, is how they have scaled uh, AI instruction by, by how they, you know, take um, you know, using the experts in that regard, the great faculty members, but then spread that out a little more and get more scalability in terms of reach. And I think those are the possibilities out there um, that'll take place. But I think that's the next evolution of online. Uh, we're still very much in the thinking in terms of courses and convenience, and I think it'll move more in terms of interactivity and connection that'll promote that sca scalability that we think mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Doug, you said you keep your classes small on purpose. Do you think that, it, that things can be scaled without losing something? Um, well, if by scale you mean larger classes, no. We, we would lose something because the, the way we're making our economics work is we we do all of our async and then we can do that over you know we do that one time so we we produce that and we could do that many times for many classes but then we do our classes small so that we've got a, we've got an instructor who knows each student very very well and we address some of what we were talking about in that last section of uh, if you put a lot of people on zoom you're going to lose a whole lot of people so we are using Zoom. We don't want a lot of people on the screen. We do want a faculty member who can see everybody's face. We don't want people disappearing and doing their email or everything else that goes on. So that's the trade-off. So we make up, a, you know, we save a ton of money because all of our lecture, et cetera, has been made, made one time, done really, really well, and used many, many times. We lose a fortune because we're teaching such small classes. You net two out, and our cost structure is about what it is on campus. Um, so that's about where we come out. Mm -hmm. Catherine, do you want to weigh in on this? Because obviously, WGU has a different model. Right. We, we do have a different model. And because, because we don't... Um, we're, we're so disruptive, right? Between everything from being completely asynchronous to 
um, the co competency based, the disaggregated faculty model. Our our faculty don't don't um, uh, don't publish. Um, we don't have athletics. Uh, we don't have uh, buildings. Um, I. I, I think that I, I want to touch on something that um, that Doug said earlier about this paradigm shift of online education. And that is this, that we are already in a time in our country where a four-year residential college experience is not possible for so many people. And what we're seeing right now with um, some of some smaller private universities that have not been able to stay open even before COVID, um, and the incredible expense of a four-year college education, is is that we're we're going to see our first-generation college goers start to reject this idea that they have to go away to school and live on campus. Um, if we are truly in this country going to start expanding educational opportunities, um, we are going to have to think differently about that traditional model. Although this is actually not true in the UNC system, most public university systems spend more on um, uh, the amenities than they do on the teaching on, on a campus. And um, uh, what, what I would say is that the first, the first thing that a traditional campus could do is to um, is to switch to that competency-based model because that does save money in, in the long run. Um, the credit hour is not efficient. Um, so I, I, I think that what we're talking about here is just who, you know, the winners are going to be those who realize that they have to break away from some old models and traditions in order to serve more people. And, and, and students. And that, those are gonna be hard conversations. Marty, I know that accessibility has been very important to the UNC Board of Governors. It's part of the strategic plan. What is the role of online education in that accessibility? And do you think that there should be different fee structures for online students? I think accessibility should apply to all 10 million North Carolinians, not 250,000 students that we have in our system. So I would like for accessibility to mean that we're taking every North Carolinian out there that has an interest in improving some part of their life or skill set and helping them achieve that and become happier, better at what they do. Um, learning new skills, mitigating risk, uh, and push that out there. Because, you know, I, I quote the uh, state constitution a bunch, but the idea of providing the benefits of the university to the people of the state as free as practicable is important. And it, it's not providing the benefits of the university to the students of the university, it's to the people of the state. And so for me, accessibility means that we reach out to millions of people on an on annual basis and, and provide them the opportunity because someone has to take that opportunity. But I, I'd love to see us develop more programs like Google Grow, uh, which I think is gonna be another game changer that will take skill sets that people need and provide them that. And I'll, I'll play the other side of it because Joe Nod is not here, but uh, he and I have had several spirited debates in the uh, Board of Governors meeting there needs to also be a need to develop uh, critical thinkers out there and really not just skill sets. But I think we've got to solve that issue too, that it can't just be only training for the skill to get you a job. It has to um, be preparing you to, to be an informed citizen and a citizen that can reason and have logic, which I think is severely lacking somewhat these days. Moving from talking about scalable, I want to talk about some of the free resources that are out there uh, because I think a lot of people are, are using them, especially right now. And Khan Academy comes to mind immediately. I know that when I had to, you know, go home with my seven-year-old and make sure he learned during the day, Khan Academy was one of the first things I checked out. 
Um, and in preparation for this event today, you know, I, I restarted my Duolingo account. I signed up for some free Hillsdale classes just to see like what is out there in the realm of free and you know, is it any good? Um, are these free resources relevant to higher education if they don't provide a credential? You know, are they any good? Is there something that universities and community colleges can learn from these free resources? If any, this is open to anybody. I think there's a lot of terrific stuff out there. Um, and I access those materials myself. Um, I think that one of the things though is it, they're, they're sort of like a library. Um, they've not yet moved into the position where completion rates are very good. So if you take like MOOCs, five, six years ago MOOCs, there was all this, MOOCs are gonna take over everything. But we look at the completion rates for MOOCs and they're almost always single digits. Um, and so there seems to be something that um, few of us seem to be able to complete a course working alone. We need, we need a structure, we need classmates, we need, uh, we need an institution, we need something to enable us to do it. I, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know that I can put my finger on it, um, but we don't seem to be able to complete those kind of things. But you can go up on the internet right now and if you take an MBA program, you can basically find the entire Wharton MBA program free on the internet. But, but I don't think you find very many people saying, well, I'm going to take all the courses that Wharton offers for free and I won't go to Wharton. Um, so, you know, it's not that we've got a lack of material. It's the same way I think about libraries. The libraries are filled with books, books that can teach you about incredible things, but when I walk into the libraries, the books seem to be still on the shelves. They, it's not like the, the libraries have all been stripped, and I can't find any books if I go in a library. So there seems to be some other element that we need, but these materials are very, very good. Right. And I'll comment on that, too. I think, I mean, I think Doug's right. I think what's, you know, there, there's more available now, and there's great stuff out there now, but it takes somewhat of a curation of that, all those resources. Um, without, you know, kind of being able to sort that out. And I think that's sometimes where students would struggle to a certain extent. It's tough to, without knowing exactly where some of those resources may be. Uh, we have tried to pioneer within the North Carolina Community College system sharing of those resources. That's why we have what's called a virtual learning community to share those resources. But then there's a lot of resources that are not free that are even better because they've been developed in certain ways. So you'll see a lot of those types of learning objects that are that are not free in essence. And so it takes kind of a, you know, I think that's part of the, the instructor role of the future. It's not just about being the, the lecturer, uh, you know, of the past, but it's also the curator of what's the most appropriate resources for that particular um, learning objective and helping to curate that. And then also knowing now that uh, for students who have different types of learning styles, it's not just one type of learning object. It can be multiple different types of learning objects that are all focused on the same, the same objective, but offer different ways of getting there for different students. And that, that, that notion of being able to curate what's out there, whether it's free or whether you have to pay for it, I think part of what the, the teachers of the future are going to be about. Jenna, I think part of it too is um, how entertain, you know, people have a certain amount of free time to spend. And what do they want to do in that free time? Do they want to learn a new skill? Hopefully, yes. Um, but only if they feel like the skill is valuable to them, um, if it's entertaining. Um, you know, people can learn how to play a video game, let's say, and they, they may jump into that. But there are also a lot of people that may buy a home gym and they aren't going to use the home gym unless they have a personal trainer. So I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a tricky model. We've got to make education more entertaining and attractive and make people feel like it's a distraction. And then we also need to provide some coaching and some supplemental, um, you know, follow up for people to encourage them or keep them on track as well. So I think, gamification or making them more entertaining and also um, some sort of coaching out there um, to help them are the keys. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think one of the things I really like about Duolingo is that, you know, it reminds me every day, time to take your lesson. And um, that, that helps a lot. Um, but I'll just, I'll go to our last, last question before I open it up to Q&A. And that is to ask you, you know, what do you see post COVID? And, you know, Nicole, I've, I've neglected you for a little while. So I'll go to you first. Um, once COVID is over and we have a vaccine or we have excellent treatments and things are back to uh, normal in terms of our, our pandemic, you know, what are students going to do? Well, I think it'll honestly be a while before we return to fully normal. Um, I know when COVID first started, it, I kind of, I thought this semester would be fully normal and it's no different than last semester. So I think, I think it'll be a while and I think it'll be us slowly easing out of fully online how we are now. Um, but I think online courses will be a bigger part of campus. I know at UNC, um, there's already a lot of online courses you can take. I've taken one for the past several semesters before COVID. Um, and I think students will be looking more for that during COVID. I think they'll kind of get used to the flexibility of online courses and not necessarily having to be on campus or pay for off-campus housing or those things where I think they'll start expecting more flexibility in how they learn and how they attend class. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, uh, Doug, what do you see? Did we lose Doug again? Uh, okay. No, no, I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just a little slow to get my unmuted. Um, I think uh, it's going to have dramatic change. Uh, for one thing, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a group. I've been with a group of, uh, at Chapel Hill of, of eight of us have been meeting for about 20 years. Um, and we've gone from young, younger people to not as young now. Um, I've been doing this online thing, as I mentioned earlier, for about a decade. When I first started, I think uh, the rest of them finally, locked, finally reconciled that I was in the business school and thus I was just weird. Um, <laughs> we met about two weeks ago and, and two of the people who had just adamantly said, I would never have anything to do with this, said, I am teaching better now, even with all the problems that we have with COVID than I've ever taught before. And the reason was is they've simply learned some things like flipping classes, uh, they've breakout rooms you can do in this setting that you can't do in a classroom. You, you know, it's hard to separate people and say, you go sit over in this corner and you sit in this corner. And, and, and these two people are like, they're like online evangelists now. And I was astounded. So, you know, it won't be every faculty member and it's not every student. You know, some students, this isn't a good learning form for them. But I think it's going to be remarkable how many faculty are going to come back and say, you know, instead of me just lecturing, uh, we'll flip all the classes. We'll put the stuff over here. And, oh, you know, it might be better if we did this and that. Um, again, I think we were, we were moving here, but this is, this is like the ice age calls the dinosaurs to go away and the, the mammals took over. It is, a, it is going to rapidly lead toward much faster evolution than we, we were going to have. And so we're going to move to a point where technology is going to play a bigger and bigger role in the classroom. And someday I think we'll look back and have a discussion about what we're talking about here and using words like online. And it's sort of like the first time you ever saw a cell phone, but that cell phone that you first saw is profoundly different from an iPhone. And I think some of the things that Marty's mentioned, VR and some gamification, those kind of technologies are going to sweep in and they can now sweep in because we built this foundation where technology is not a scary thing. It's not an inferior thing. It doesn't mean I'm not a real teacher. So this just rapidly moves us to a point where as an instructor, I have a lot more tools I can use. As a student, I'm, I'm receptive to all sorts of different ways that I can learn. And again, the important thing is the student, the important thing is how do we best learn? Mm -hmm. Scott, I see you nodding your head. Do you want to chime in? Well, I think for us, what it'll look like for us is, and we talk about it quite a bit now, I, I think we'll be more of a blended weight tech. And I think that means that, I, I don't know, I, I suspect we'll have probably more things that are fully online, more courses that are fully online, but I think what'll really be 
a change for us is everything will be more blended. The, and there'll be the, not the either or, but the both, the accessibility of both and the supplement of even in a welding class or a dental assisting class where perhaps every particular class is seated, it will be supplemented by online and have online supplements to it. I think one thing too we have to keep in mind too, and Doug just mentioned it, is that it's not about just how well we can teach, but it'll also be about how well our students can learn from online. And we have to keep that in mind, and particularly right now. I mean, if we look at the numbers that just came out in the last couple of weeks about student enrollment in college, it is lower income students that are not where we're seeing the enrollment aspects. And, and when I, you know, I'll just give you an example. I, before COVID, I did forums with faculty, staff, and students once a semester on every one of our six campuses. Now I do with them almost every week through um, our Microsoft Teams. Now that's much more efficient uh, and I think I'll, in the future, though, I will do both because I think both will be needed. And I think when we talk about our students right now, we have to keep in mind that for many of our students, they face, they feel anxiety. They don't feel connected as much sometimes. We have to be aware of that. And for lower income students, it's one thing to be uh, online when you have all the technology and you can go into an office. But when you've got you know, three kids at home and you're a single mom and school's out and you've got one computer and you don't have great access. A lot of our students I hear from is they want to be back. They want, they, they want, they, they need that presence. And I think the future for us will be both. It will be the access and the support that you can get online, but it will also be the presence physically as well, particularly for a place like a community college. I think Nicole nailed it when she said that students are going to, um, they're going to expect different things, in, including more, more flexibility. Um, I, I think that in, in the post COVID world, that in higher education, student retention is going to be largely dependent upon um, what digital engagement looks like. And to that, I would, I would add that, um, the, the inst institutions that are going to continue down this road of more of a blended model um, will, and, and in particular, um, institutions serving 18 to, to 24 year olds, um, will need to create uh, more of a, an online community of care if, if they haven't already. Um, and and that, that community of care needs to be ready to address whatever barriers come up, whether it's um, a hurricane or a pandemic, um, or, you know, our, our mentor model, the fact that every student has a mentor, when it's not something that's widespread, but something like a death in the family, or in the case of someone in the military, a deployment, um, that, that piece is going to be critical as institutions seek to serve students in, in new and different ways. Excellent. Thank you. And now I'm going to move to our um, Q&A from our viewers. And I'll start with a question from Jonathan Price. He says, I teach at Oxford University. We have a tutorial model, weekly meetings of one tutor and up to three students for which students prepare an assignment, either an essay or completion of a set of problems or lab that costs them, a, costs them about 40 hours of individual effort. You know, they need to defend their work weekly. This model translates wonderfully to online environments. I use it for private students from all over the world. It has limitations and probably only is appropriate for, gift, for gifted and motivated students. Is anyone trying this sort of individualized education, maybe as a sort of honors track for your better students at state schools or even community colleges? And I'll open that to anyone. Not that I'm aware of. Oxford is a special place. Yeah, that, that's my impression as well. Marty, did you want to chime in? If, uh, if they'd like to admit my son, I'm sure he'd be glad to participate in that program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine too. In like, <laughs> um, and here's a, here's a question for all everyone who's teaching right now. What platforms are faculty members using to engage online students? We're using Zoom. A lot of my professors are using, I kind of touched on this earlier, but they're using online forums. 
Um, so I have one class um, where we talk a lot about Supreme Court cases. And so um, each week, the professor will pose a new question about recent court decisions and the class will all have to chime in on Piazza and it's very um, conversational. So kind of trying to simulate that sort of in-class conversational atmosphere online. Yeah, I think that I've, I've heard a lot of people using Zoom as well. Um, we, we use Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft to... Teams, okay. Okay, a, a question for Nicole. Uh, and this is from a professor of computer science. He says, for coding, you can screen share, right? For me, that works even better than being there because I don't have to look over someone's shoulder to see their screen. Uh, is that something you've been using as a ULA? Yeah, especially during workshop hours. It's, it is handy because you're not kind of like in someone's personal space trying to look at their screen. Um, but it does have some limitations, especially if they come across an error that I don't know off the top of my head what the solution is to, or if they're um, having trouble uploading a file and it's it's not just a simple common problem, it can really help to actually like get your hands on their computer and try out a couple things yourself. Um, and you can't do that over Zoom. It's just you telling them what to try, which can be frustrating at times. Um, it can also be frustrating if there's some work that they're supposed to um, complete kind of individually. So you might not want them sharing their screen so that other students can see it. And um, this class tries to draw a lot of sort of broader concepts from these coding problems, just in terms of um, like running models in political science. Um, and so we kind of try to spur a conversation based on a lot of the coding assignments, um, which can be sometimes difficult to do over Zoom, especially if students don't have their um, their camera on, you can't, it's harder to pressure them into conversation when it's just sort of a blank screen, um, which is something that's a lot easier to do in class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, kind of dovetails into the next question was, what are the major problems posed by online education that, and can they be solved by, te by new technologies? Um, what issues do you, you foresee or hope will be solved by technical innovations? Well, I'll start. Uh, one of the things that we know at Wake Tech, um, you know, 2013, we really put a lot of emphasis in online education, but one of the challenges for us is we did see equity differences when we looked at students, you know, students uh, coming from different backgrounds, uh, um, students, you know, socioeconomic differences. And so we tried to pay attention to that. And, and so we had a program. And a lot of that was about how you define the engagement, the use of. And so it was things in terms of how you communicate, you know, the, the, the um, timing of communications, reaching out in that regard, engagement, representation of students when we're thinking about, you know, different tools that we're using. And so, you know, and, and we did it from a experimental basis. And we were able to improve retention gaps and some, and different types of challenges that we faced. But a lot of it was, it was having the capability of different tools, but it was also being very thoughtful about how instructors were engaging and interacting so that students felt a personal connection that without that kind of intentionality of it, I think they, they lost somewhat. So that's been something we've paid attention to here to try to overcome what we were seeing as equity gaps that have often been found in, in distance education is not really thoughtful in that regard. Any other comments on that one? Okay, I'm gonna move on there. I have two related questions and they're both about assessments um, and I'll read both of them. One is how do you assure integrity of testing and assessment of learning using online technology? And another, what platforms have been the most successful in proctoring exams remotely and ensuring test security? And I'll add that I, this was a question that I was gonna ask and I ran out of time because I've heard horror stories about real invasions of student privacy trying to proctor tests. So, you know, what works, what does preserve the integrity and what, what have you found? And anyone can take this question. I'll start off with that one. Um, so I'll, I'll, it depends on the assessment. Our assessment faculty are separate 
from um, the course instructor and the mentors. And so assessments are done blindly. Um, so if it's a written assessment that gets submitted online, then we have a about us, um, a, we have an SLA that says it has to be returned to the student within 72 hours. Um, now, if it's a, a lab or a performance-based assessment, we have uh, students have special cameras. The, the room, there's a, an online proctor. The room gets scanned. Um, and ac actually the, um, the entire, not just the room, but the, the, the desk is scanned. Um, and we have had um, instances where someone has entered the room during, uh, this has been a challenge for us during COVID because more people are at home at any given time. And if someone opens the door, then the assessment has to stop. So um, we, we do have very strong um, testing protocols in place for security, but it's so strong that it's actually been um, uh, frustrating for some folks um, during, during COVID. Well, yeah, what we do, I mean, I think it's a real, it's a real challenge. Uh, what we do is uh, all exams are taken online and with your webcam on and everything's recorded and archived. If there's any uh, question about the exam, then we've got the archive uh, that we can go back and look at. Um, but, you know, this is, a, I give the answer here that I give sometimes to other questions about online. And that is, uh, trust me, it's not like there's zero cheating that goes on in a classic residential classroom either. So sometimes it's sort of like, well, here's a problem with online. And I, and I say, you're right, it is a problem. But unfortunately, I can't, I can't give you assurance there's never been any cheating going on in my school in the residential form. And so uh, it is a problem. We probably rely as much on the character of the students as anything else. But we have, we have tall students out of our program. Um, and we've used this as the procedure of, of uh, identifying that clearly they were not, they were not, um, they violated the appropriate, you know, they, they violate, make violations. Mm -hmm. I'll move uh, to a different, oh, you got, okay, Scott, go ahead if, you, if you've got uh, something as well. That's an area that, you know, we were paying attention to but with COVID now and everything being online as we were last spring and now 70% this you know, that issue has been a point of issue for faculty, uh, and particularly in some programs more than others. Um, one of the things that we are paying attention to is investments. Uh, we've made some interim investments more in our proctoring technologies, but longer term, those kind of proctoring technologies that are out there will be greater investments for us as we move more online, because that is a point of concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to another question and I'll have to read it, it's a long one. I have two young adult students, one who participated in online high school classes, one with George Washington University and one with K-12. My current college student at a Tennessee public university went online last summer, this spring, this summer, and now this fall. Both students expressed that they don't think they're retaining the information as well, doing the readings, listening to lectures, completing the assignments, posting some required comments and discussions, and earning A's, but they don't think they're really getting the, the full benefit. In particular, my college student thought the summer classes this year were poorly designed, the, dist the instructors were disorganized, and it all seemed pretty pro forma to her. For one class, she never did receive a syllabus, and assignments were given with 24 hour turnarounds. So here's the question. What systems are the schools putting in place to ensure quality and accountability with professors? And I, I think I'd make a comment just in general to start with that, you know, we're dealing with unprecedented times here. So, you know, no one's dealt with this before where we're all on, have been on lockdown. I think a lot of people are distracted. It's an election year. There's, there's just, a, and there's uh, unrest in the streets. I think there's a lot going on right now that's not only distracting for students and parents, but also teachers out there as well. And so I would encourage people to have just a little bit more understanding during this time that, you know, this isn't a normal situation and we aren't dealing with a normal online ed program. We're dealing with people being kind of thrown into this very quickly 
and having to adjust rapidly for not something that was uh, foreseeable for the market, but an, an immediate adjustment. But I, I would leave the specific answers up to uh, people like Doug or Scott or uh, Catherine who can speak more to um, what the measures they're putting in place. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think Marty's right, and I'll I'll link up to something Scott said early on. I think that you have to train instructors to teach in this environment. Uh, you can't expect that someone can walk in off the street and just start teaching. So um, in the kind of triage world we're in, um, this university may or may not have the opportunity to, to uh, give the training that instructors needed um, to be able to teach in this environment. Um, it, you can't just presume that people can do that. But with you know, not an extraordinary amount of work. Um, instructors can go from, I, I feel very scared and nervous in this environment, I've never done this, to, okay, I feel like I can, I've got a command of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to one of the things that were, was in that question. She specifically mentioned that her, one of her students said, or both of them said, they're not retaining as much information. And I know there have been studies that have shown that if you read a novel on your Kindle, that's fine. But if you read a textbook on your Kindle, you're not going to retain as much. The written and the written paper page is better than the Kindle for for reading, you know, nonfiction information. Um, do you think that it's possible that there are retention problems with online delivery of course materials? And I. Scott or Catherine? I, I mean, I, I just have to say that, you know, we've been doing this for 23 years. So I, 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 I would, um, I would say that our outcomes show otherwise. I, but I do agree that um, with, with what Marty said and, and also with what Doug said. And, and, and to that, I will add that um, the Zoom feature makes the brain work harder. You, using Zoom, um, all day long uh, or for 45 minutes, your brain has to work harder. Um, and it has to do with the faces and the, the social cues and the time lag. And it's this is all things that we don't even realize are happening. But um, from what I've read, the, the science is pretty clear on that. So that may have something to do with, um, with lack of retention. Mm -hmm. I think we also have to be careful too, when we talk about online instruction, that we don't just assume that that is online instruction is a Zoom environment. You know, I think what Marty was talking about earlier, I think we start to get into areas like gamification and other things that will promote retention. And so I think it's less about um, platforms. I, you know, I think in, we could be in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater because I think online instruction can open up multiple opportunities for, for greater retention, but it can also promote opportunities that don't allow for much retention. I think that's perhaps the big challenge with online. In the early days of online, when I used to say that it perhaps allowed the greatest, greatest variance in instructing instruction that you could find, you know? And the reason I say that, when I just recall in the early years, almost 20 years ago, having a situation where a student came to me and said, I have not heard from my instructor yet this semester. And it was almost Thanksgiving and I was shocked. You know, because I knew in a, if in a seated world, I, that would never happen. You know, I would know the next week if they were not meeting. But in that case, it allowed for it because in those days, you know, in the early days, people could post PowerPoints and post notes and call that an online class. Well, we kind of got more informed about that. We got better about that. Institutions, you know, we have what's called quality matters and things like that to, to look at quality. But really, I think when you get to the other side, it is about, as Doug was saying earlier, it's about you know, our, our teachers, our instructors, having those best practices, having those tools, going through the instruction and training themselves, that's the, that's the real quality control is, is empowering them. It's not watching over their shoulder. And I think as we do that, we'll see that they're even more engaged and they have even greater tools. And I think the tools like gamification and other things will just make them more engaged environment. So I think we have to be very careful not to assume that online instruction is just watching Zoom or, or reading someone else's PowerPoint. And, and that, that could be a, a real risk these days. 
I, I think one one good way that I've heard this described is that um, in this in this triage situation that Doug was describing and, and Marty is that um, before that training occurs and and professors having to sort of flip that switch and transition overnight to uh, remote learning it. it the, the idea that the, if, if you um, were to film a play and then release it as a major motion picture, I think that that's, that, that doesn't work, right? And that, that's what a lot of us have had to resort to um, who are new to this, to this idea. But that's not what we're gonna see moving forward with online instruction. That, that's not what it looks like in Doug's program or, or our program or programs that have been doing this for a while. And so we, we are going to um, see, um, uh, more training and, and opportunities for improvement provided to professors, I, I have no doubt. Well, thank you all. It's now 1.32 and we, we said we'd get everybody out of here by 1.30 and so I wanna do that as, click, as closely as we can. Um, thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to our participants. And uh, I think we've had a great discussion today and I know that we are all look for, looking forward to COVID being over so that we can engage in online learning and with online tools because we want to and not because we have to. So thanks everybody. I think, I hope you all have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you.